preparation for our considering of what God commands us to do in the sixth commandment, we read from God's word this morning as it's found in Luke chapter 10. Luke, the gospel narrative of Jesus Christ according to Luke chapter 10. The first 20 verses of this chapter deal with Jesus sending out the 70 to proclaim that gospel. He concludes in verse 21 by saying, Rejoice not that the spirits, they were able to remove demons, that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. And now the passage that we want to consider. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered to me of my Father. And no man who knoweth who the Son is but the Father, and who the Father is but the Son, and he to whom the Son will reveal him. And he turned him unto his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things that ye see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked to on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took two pence, and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three, thinkest thou, was neighbor unto him, that fell among the thieves? And he said, he that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go and do likewise. Now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much suffer serving, and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bitter, therefore, that she help me. Jesus answered and said unto her, 
Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. We stop in our reading of the Word of God there, and we pray His blessing upon the reading. In answering the question, Master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And then to demonstrate what it means to love God with everything and your neighbor as yourself, Jesus told the parable of the Good Samaritan. The question that the certain lawyer asked was, Who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Which Jesus answered by answering the question, Whose neighbor are you? Not who is your neighbor, but whose neighbor are you? And that was how he finished it in verse 36. Which of these thinkest thou was neighbor? unto him that fell among the thieves. The appropriateness of this question of Christ about whose neighbor am I is because the second part of God's law focuses on loving the neighbor, my neighbor, the neighbor that God's, well, the ones whose neighbor I am, that I love them as myself. The sixth commandment is that one which would have us focus on how are we to love our neighbor and his life. We'll get how we are to love our neighbor with his possessions, but here, how are we to love our neighbor with regard to his life? Notice that this commandment is just like all the others. And, and so we want to be really quick and brief here, but want to point this out. Every one of the commandments is God telling us something about himself. First commandment. God alone is God. Only one God. He alone must be worshipped. Second commandment. God is a spirit and so glorious, invisible, but so glorious that no picture or image can be made of him with which we could worship him. Third. God has revealed himself and that revelation that God has given of himself especially in his word, is to be hallowed, separated from all other things that we read and see. God's revelation, his name, is to be very special. Fourth commandment. God is a God of rest. And that rest is that God enjoys himself and his own work calling us to enjoy his work in creation and in Christ. Fifth commandment. God is God in that he has authority. Authority to determine what's right and wrong for his creatures. To impose that determination of what's right and wrong on his creatures telling them that he will reward those who do keep his commandment to do what right, what's right and not do what's wrong, and to punish those who don't do what he says is right and then do what's wrong. Sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill. God is teaching us about life. What? 
real life is. He's teaching us that He lives. He lives. That He is life. And that He alone gives life. And if He gives it, He alone has the right to take it. So the Sixth Commandment specifically teaches us that God is life, that God lives, and that He alone gives life. The commandments, remember the introduction, are given to us, His people, so that we know how to thank Him for what He has given to us. So specifically, one sentence statement about the sixth commandment would be this. Thank Him for redeeming salvation. Thank Him for saving you by preserving and loving the life He gives. Your own and your neighbor's. By loving and preserving the life He gives. Your own and your neighbor's. But, Always a but. When this revelation of God comes to us who are saved but still sinners, you can't help but have that glorious light of the gospel shine in such a way that it shows how murderous our natures are. But again... The whole focus isn't to point out how sinful we are. The whole focus is to show how much we've been forgiven and how we are to thank Him for that forgiveness. The life given, the life not killed, the life loved. The life given, the life not killed, the life loved. What is life that God gives? That's not the easiest question to answer. Let's realize, first of all, that life, whether it's mine or that of a, my neighbor, is a gift of God. Second, and here's where we really have to focus. Real life, remember John, Jesus' prayer the last night, just before he was betrayed, John 17, verse 3. To know God and Jesus Christ is eternal life. This is eternal life, to know God and Jesus whom he has sent. Okay. Life, then, is a wonderful, close intimacy relationship with God. Life, real life, real life is that relationship, close, intimate, communicating, Activity of communicating, loving. That's life. That's what real life is. Now, if you've got a pulse and blood pressure and brain activity, that's existence, earthly existence. And that's what we usually call life, and that's a picture. It's a picture, a type of life, real life. But make the distinction. Real life is having a relationship with God. So all those who don't have that relationship are existing dead. Spiritually dead, but having a pulse, a heartbeat, brain activity. They're existing. They have the picture, but they don't have the reality. Everybody here has the picture. Do you have the reality?
whether it's the picture or the reality, the point is that God has given it. God has bestowed that precious gift. And He gives it as a reflection of what He has ins inside Himself and within Himself. Okay, that's life. The opposite of life is death. Death isn't just the absence of brain activity, no heart rate, no breath, no breathing. But death is, now think of Genesis 2, verse 17, and think of Romans 6, verse 23. Genesis 2.17, before there was sin, God said, the day that you eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. Romans 6.23 helps us understand that. The wages of sin is death. Death is the wages earned by sin by the violations of God's commandments. God has authority to set the standard of what's right and wrong. You violate God's standard, the punishment. So death isn't just the absence of heart rate, brain activity, blood pressure. That's the ending of the picture. But the ending of the picture is a, is a type of the most horrible existence hell or living having an earthly existence without the consciousness of that relationship sometimes God's people who have tasted that relationship go through periods of, of hurt and depression and fear and they're not assured of that relationship. And to them, to live apart from God is death. They experience, it, their experience is one of great fear. Where's the relationship? To live apart from God is death. But to live with God, and to have the hope of being with God forever, that's life. So sin entered into the world. And when sin entered into the world, and one experienced the wages of sin, God's anger and wrath. Now if one doesn't have life, real life, communion with God, it is very easy to look at the picture of it and not value it very highly. If you know what real life is, then you're going to value life, the picture, existence, as a gift of God. You're going to value it. But if you don't have that real life, then you don't appreciate the picture either. Then, this is the way we say it, life is cheap. And so, last week, week and a half ago, was the anniversary of Roe v. Wade. The decision that made it legal to kill. To violate the Sixth Commandment. So millions have been killed under the name it's legit, it's lawful, The commandment is violated and life becomes cheap. Then they, the next step is euthanasia. And assisted euthanasias. But then, the next step is very easy too. And that next step is, they irritate me. They make my life stressful. They frustrate me. I have the right not only not to love them, I have the right to hate them. 
I have the right to hate those who hurt me. So when Jesus said to the lawyer, you want to know what to inherit to do to inherit eternal life? Love God with your all and love your neighbor as yourself. Who is my neighbor? Wrong question. Going to get the wrong answer. Right question is, whose neighbor am I? The priest, the most religious in all of Israel, goes down this road from Jerusalem to Jericho, sees the man half dead, and says, I don't want to get dirty, and I might be late. I'm going to just walk on the other side. The next most religious, a Levite, goes by, sees him, takes a little closer look. Uh, I've got more to do. And a Samaritan. Somebody that everybody who was a true son of Abraham hated. Hated. Here comes the Samaritan who sees this Jew who all his life undoubtedly despised the Samaritans. Him could have been somebody that he knew who had hated him. And there he is, half dead. Am I his neighbor? He answered the question. He had compassion. The Samaritan loved his neighbor, the Jew. Took care of him. Bound him up, took care of his wounds, did first aid, put him on his own donkey. He walked so that the wounded Jew could ride, brought him to an inn, paid for him to stay, watched him that night, had to go, said, whatever has to be done for him, I will cover. I've passed by here before. You know me. I'll come back. You keep, charge, you keep track of the bill, I'll pay it. But you take care of this Jew till he's well enough to go on his own. I am his neighbor. Your neighbor? Well, wrong question. You are a neighbor to... A wonderful, loving husband. You could be a neighbor to a rather irritating and sometimes tyrannical husband who doesn't listen very well. You could be a neighbor to a wife who is very tender and considerate You could be also a neighbor to a wife that you would rather be on the housetop than down below in the room with her. You are a neighbor to your brother when he's nice and you're a neighbor to your brother when he's not nice. You are a neighbor to every person that God puts in your path. In your path, right in the path of that priest, Levite, Samaritan. God's command, second point, is we may not kill that neighbor's taking his life. To kill is to assume to ourselves the authority to take that life. Jesus looked at the Pharisees and he said about them, well, he was talking more about Satan because he said, you are of your father, the devil. John 8, verse 44. And the lusts of your father you will to do. Then he said this about Satan. 
he is a murderer from the beginning. He is a murderer from the beginning. He abode not in the truth there, because there is no truth in him. He is a murderer from the beginning. Think about this. We look most like the devil when we want to kill. The Catechism says it this way. Very interesting, by the way. The previous Lord's Days uh, have been usually giving one question and answer to each of the commandments. When it comes to this commandment, there's three questions and answers. What does God require? First, this part. That neither in thoughts, thoughts, not, not even in my thinking, in my words or gestures, much less in deeds, I dishonor, hate, wound, or kill my neighbor by myself or by another. That I lay aside all desire for revenge. They did a low down, mean, evil deed. Well, don't get even down there with them. Walk the high road. No desire for revenge. Also that I hurt not myself, nor willfully expose myself to any danger. Wherefore also the magistrate is armed with the sword to prevent murder. Then... That's not enough. The fathers thought, well, we said a lot, but, but maybe God's people need to have this explained a little bit better. Does this commit? But the commandment seems only to speak about murder. In forbidding murder, God teaches us that he... Give me a strong word. How about abhors? God abhors the causes of murder, such as envy, hatred, anger, desire for revenge. We call it grudge. Bearing a grudge. And that he accounts all these as murder. It's interesting to talk with someone face to face and to ask them, do you have any grudges? And as their wheels turn, their faces show. You got anybody that you would wish weren't in your life? That they were never a neighbor to you? You still remember the things that happened in grade school? By your neighbors? And they sit every once in a while and you see them periodically? God abhors not just murder, but also the causes thereof. Nothing makes us more like the devil than those causes. That includes plotting somebody else's death. When, when Jezebel plotted Naboth's and David plotted Uriah's, Jezebel and David became guilty of violating the Sixth Commandment. They didn't, and David, for, six, for nine months, for nine months, David lived believing his own 
understanding. He leaned on his own understanding and he said, I didn't kill him, the enemy did. God said differently. When one assists and consents in another's death, the Apostle Paul recognized that he was a murderer when he, when he stood and took care of the coats of those who stoned Stephen. Pilate was guilty of murder when he could have prevented the death of Jesus, but he did not. He may have washed his hands as many times as he wanted to. He was only trying to salve his own conscience. God's verdict was, you are a murderer, Pilate. The scriptures make it very clear that we are guilty even when we occasion a death accidentally. That's why there were cities of refuge. To distinguish between intended and unintended slaughter. Unintended. No evidence of previous hatred. They were allowed to still continue their earthly existence, but they had to do it in one of the six cities. They weren't allowed to go to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover or to bring a sacrifice. They weren't allowed to live with their families or their homes in the land that God had given to their family in the land of Canaan. They could exist until the priest died, but always they had to stay within the border of one of those six cities of refuge. They were guilty of murder. God makes it very clear that we not only can kill a life by taking a life, but we can also kill a soul. When a watchman doesn't properly warn about the presence of enemies, they're guilty of murder of a soul. Ezekiel 3, verse 18, makes clear. When I don't teach as I should or could or have an opportunity to, and a soul is starved spiritually, murder. Murder is wrong because we touch God in three ways. Murder is wrong because we touch God this way. We take what He has given, what He alone has given, and therefore He alone has the right to take. Two, we touch God when we pass judgment on His all-wise judgment about my neighbor, whose neighbor I am. When he puts somebody in my path that I would wish was not there at all for, a, for the rest of my life or even for just a few moments, then I am placing judgment on the all-wise and loving providence of God that makes me a neighbor to that individual for a while. Third and most importantly, we touch God who created man in his own image, Genesis 9, verse 6. There can be all kinds of questions and discussions about whether the image of God is still in a reprobate. Wherever you go with it, the bottom line always has to be this. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, shall man by his, shall man by his blood, life be shed. You take somebody else's life, elect or reprobate, makes no difference. You are worthy of death. You are guilty of violating the Sixth Commandment. It is not our right. Now remember that in that Genesis 9 verse 6 passage, it's giving to the authority, to the rulers, the right to make that execution. That's why God legitimately commands capital punishment. Exodus 21 even makes clear that if you knew that your ox 
was a goring ox, a pushing ox. And you didn't fence him in, and he brought about the death of your neighbor. You not only stoned that ox, you are stoned. That's how valuable God considers human life to be. Scripture shows that the power of death to kill is not just in a sword and gun or a fist, but in the tongue. The tongue has power to give life, encouragement, and it has the power to kill. The Catechism says gestures. Have you ever seen the look that kills? If looks could kill, God does not just command us not to kill. Is it enough that we do not kill any man in the manner mentioned above? Question and answer 107. No, no, it's not enough. For when God forbids envy, hatred, and anger, he commands us to love our neighbor. Not who's my neighbor. He commands us to love our neighbor as ourselves, to show patience, Peace, meekness, pride, Proverbs says, brings contention. Pray for meekness. Show patience, peace, meekness, mercy, and all kindness towards him. And prevent his hurt as much as in us lies. Prevent his hurt as much as in you lies. And that we do good. Catch this. Even to our enemies. God requires the preservation of life. God requires love of the neighbor. While we don't have the time a lot of focus could be given on what it means to love ourselves. Truly, correctly, biblically, to love ourselves. One is not going to understand how to love a neighbor unless one correctly knows how to love oneself. Out of the millions of ways there is to love oneself wrong, the way to love ourselves is the way God loves us. To know and to see ourselves as God sees us. That is, in Jesus Christ. And to learn how to make a distinction in the thoughts that we always have about ourselves. Thoughts always about ourselves. How to distinguish in the thinking that we have about ourselves between wrong loving of self and right loving of self. Bottom line, second commandment that Jesus said, you, I can't give you just the first. You asked for only one. I can't just give you one. I've got to give you two as well. Because to love the Lord is to love your neighbor and yourself. To love the Lord. To hate your neighbor and yourself is to hate God. So to love oneself is the only right way to begin know how to know how to love your neighbor. 
Love the Lord with everything and love your neighbor as yourself. You and I, you and I, may, may never say to love that neighbor is impossible. We may never say that. The reprobate cannot. You, as the regenerated, can. You can do what they cannot do. You can, because the first of the nine fruit of the Spirit, you have the Spirit, the first fruit of the nine is love. Romans 5, verse 5, The love of God is poured out in your hearts, and that's the greatest power the knowledge that you have of God's love for you is the greatest power to break through and overcome any desire to hate, to revenge. If we have no love for the brother, then 1 John 4 makes it abundantly clear you have no love for God. If you have a grudge... Don't deceive yourselves into thinking. But I love God. You've got it wrong. Love of God is reflected in loving your neighbor. The right order would be loving God means you know how to love yourself and your neighbor. pattern, the pattern is always reflecting His love for us. So, if love of God is two, loving ourselves is three, loving our neighbor as ourselves is four, number one is where it all starts. And number one is God loves even me. Still. And this is what he did to love me. He gave himself, his only begotten son. And he still loves. Because grace is love undeserved. And it's still love that he gives. And that's the pattern. So that unconditional love with which He loves us is then the love that becomes unconditional. I will love you if, I will love you when, and when you don't, then I... No. Unconditional love is given. Unconditional love is to be reflected. And that love isn't just... in. Yeah, it's an attitude, but it doesn't stay that. It becomes an activity. He had compassion on him. He didn't look at the, oh, you poor sucker, there you are. You're hurting so bad. You're half dead. Ah. Oh. No, his compassion became an activity. He immediately went into activity. He bound up his wounds. He poured oil and wine. He did everything that he could with whatever instruments he had to do first aid. Put him on his donkey. Paid for him. His love, his compassion, became an activity. The... The love that God requires of us is that we see what true religion really is. What must I do to inherit eternal life? What's written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering gave the right answer. Love the Lord with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind and your neighbor as yourself. 
Jesus said, you have answered right. You've answered right. Do this, and thou shalt have life. Now remember life? Life is, I'm hearing God communicate to me, and I'm communicating with Him. I am enjoying the fact that God has established this relationship. He is my God. I will be a God to you. I'm experiencing this, this fact that that Almighty, Holy Creator is dwelling with me and promises to be with me. And He forgives me. And He doesn't remember my transgressions anymore. That's the kind of God He is. That's the kind of relationship. I enjoy that. That's life. That's real life. And then that's out of the power of that life. I want to love Him. I want to do His will. I want to thank Him and honor Him. Not only when I look up, but also when I look horizontal and I see what He and that love puts in my path. And if this is the ones that He puts in my path, then those are the ones that I want to show my thanks to Him for. Even when they embarrass me and cry in church. I'm going to love them. But not just because they're mine, but because they're His wise neighbor given to me. For his sake. Amazed. At the selfless. Unconditional love. That God gives to us. We are to love. And then. Show patience. Peace. Meekness. Mercy. And all kindness. There are those that identify themselves by, the by their profession of religion and their profession of faith and they're living a life regulated by that profession that makes them identified as my neighbor, my brother and my sister. There is a higher level that God calls for us when it comes to brothers and sisters, even when we were in grade school with each other and they did those nasty things or we to them. Love. You can't say, I'm going to love them, but not like them. Don't make distinctions that are not biblical. You care for them. You do good to them. And that's why when it comes to all other neighbors that I don't hear them make a profession of faith and live life regulated by it, what is my duty towards God to what is God what is my duty from God toward them to do good? To pray for them. The highest good you can do for your neighbor that does not profess faith is pray for them and do good to them. So much so that you reflect your heavenly Father who does good to those who don't do good to Him, who does good constantly to everyone, every one of His creatures. He doesn't love them all, but He does good to every single one. Psalm 145, Matthew 5, last part. He does good to all. We, reflecting that we are His children, and not children of the devil, but God's children, we call Him Father, then we, reflecting Him, do good. We return evil with good. We overcome evil with good and not be overcome of evil. We ask for wisdom to know what to say and when to say. And we realize that the Bible never allows us to shun them. but to shame them by doing good to them. Shame is when they realize they did evil to us, but we do good to them. That's when they're ashamed. The Catechism teaches us that it starts with praying for the development of a meek and quiet spirit. Something that 
First Peter says, is in God's sight of great price. The opposite of meekness is pride. Pride, Proverbs 13, verse 10 says, always leads to contention. The Proverbs also say, shun angry persons. There are people in this world that are angry people. Shun them because that kind of anger spreads quickly. But the real focus and duty that God calls from us in this sixth commandment is that we look at life and his love. We look at the life that he has given. And we know what real life is. Real life. We consider the picture, but also the reality. And then he says, this is the way you respect the real life. You love me. Love and your neighbor, yourself, and your neighbor. Amen. O oh Lord, Thou as Lord has set before us Thy commandment. And though with weakness it may have been explained, it's very clear what Thou wilt have us to do. We raise questions sometimes and we discuss and debate specific actions. But thy law is clear. It is simple. It's hard, but it's very simple. And may we strive with everything we have to reflect thy love for us in giving us real life by showing how much we enjoy that life, by honoring the lives of those in our path. For Jesus' sake we pray this. Amen.